effort. And I, I wanted to kick off by, by saying, I, I've just, I'm, congratulations, we're almost through boot camp. Um, and and for what, I, what I'm hearing and what I'm experiencing, I'm in the classroom as well. It's going really well. I know how hard everyone is working, students, the staff, the faculty, and, and I've, been, I've been really pleased. This, is, this has gone surprisingly well, and, and I've seen a lot of deep learning and engagement. So uh, I applaud all of you for, for, for getting here to Berkeley in, in person or virtually and, and your hard work and making this a fantastic year. So, so kudos, kudos to all, all of you. And then moving to the, 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 the star and celebrity of, of, of today's event, uh, I'm looking forward to introducing uh, Layla Seca. Uh, the most important thing in, in Layla's biography is that she went to UC Davis and that she's an Aggie like myself. So uh, it's, it's about an hour up the road. Uh, and uh, that, that's very important show. She was born and raised in Berkeley. So there's a, there's a lot of Berkeley uh, fiber in her. She spent three years in the Peace Corps in Mali. Uh, and then 12 years at Salesforce, and her career has been in project management and, and engineering. Uh, and so I don't know if everybody can clap. I guess we won't hear the clapping, but I'll, I'll clap for you, Layla. Here, oh, here we go. Sweet. Welcome. You don't yes. <laughs> so, um, well, let me kick us off here. Um, I, some of these questions I've got names for, uh, and uh, I'd like this one comes from Rebecca Sung. Uh, did the company culture at Salesforce drastically change? after the $3 million pledge to close the gap. And, and was it a gradual change or an abrupt change? And do you know if it's still changing today? So, so what impact did this, this whole effort have on the, on the culture? Yeah, um, yes, the company did change. The company changed as soon as we announced that we were gonna look at it. Um, behavior changed, uh, the way people looked at hiring started changing. I actually think the way people were giving out raises sort of changed. Um, and it changed again when we feel, figured out there was a $3 million problem. And then again, the next year, there was another $3 million problem. And then the next year. So um, yeah, it definitely changed the company. Because of what we did with Equal Pay, Mark Benioff, our boss, eventually went out and hired the first chief diversity officer. That title didn't exist. And then Salesforce hired that, a guy named Tony Profit, who's still there. Um, and now almost every software company of any size has a chief diversity officer. So yeah, not only did we change Salesforce, we sort of changed the way tech thought about how they approached issues around diversity, whether that be women or people of color or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, and so that's, I think some very positive things that, that your effort resulted in. Uh, Sahil uh, Patel asks, did Salesforce lose any, did you lose any of your top performing employees? after doing this adjustment? Did anybody leave, do you think, it's you know, maybe hard to assess causality here. Did anybody leave because of, because of this effort or because they felt I don't like think so. I don't think, people were proud of this. Um, there was skepticism and there's always skepticism when you do something like this, when you break out of the mold, when you step outside of the boundaries of what's acceptable and what everyone understands to be okay. You know, before this, no one was talking about how much money you made. Like it's not okay, it was taboo to talk about you make this much, I make that, but no one talked about it. So we weren't just breaking into a gender conversation. We were sort of shifting through the way the community and technology sort of approached making money and starting to make that more of a common dialogue thing. So um, I don't think anyone left, although some may have. They certainly wouldn't have told me. Yeah, <laughs> That's why yeah, they're it's hard to know. Um, yeah. But I do think that it helped us recruit a lot of women a lot of black executives or, uh, you know, not a lot, but more than there were before. Um, and, and definitely it, it sort of helped the company gain consciousness about this because before this, everyone was like, oh yeah, yeah, we're equal. It's equal. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, no problem. Everything's equal. After this, that no longer was, they couldn't do that anymore, anywhere. So yeah, I, I think, and, and most of the executives felt pretty proud of the company for standing up and doing that. I felt, you know, there were some executives I did not feel very supported by, but most of them I felt pretty supported by, and they were proud of Salesforce and they were proud of us for doing it. So, so after the fact, people, you know, they, they got on board and, 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 and you know, there's lots of, uh, well, you, you were yes. heroin and, and everybody was, it, it wasn't easy though. And, and we, you, you went into that in your earlier interview no, <laughs> and, and, no. uh, and, and looking back here, would you do anything differently strategically or tactically if you do this? And, and, and how did you overcome your setbacks? Oh gosh, that's such a good question. 
I'm, I'm sure there are things I would do differently. Um, it's hard to really articulate exactly what they were. Um, but definitely, I probably would have done a little bit more educating to the other executives while we were going through it. I mean, we did vet it with a couple of key people in the, before we brought it to our CEO. Um, but I, I don't think I realized how hard it was going to be for the white male executives to change their behavior. And, and not because they didn't want to, but just because when the whole system is set up for you to benefit, it's very hard to see where the problems are in the system. They were like, well, you're here, Layla. And I was like, yeah, I'm one person. <laughs> I'm the 50% of the population is female. Like I'm mm -hmm. one human being. It's not like you made it gender equal because I made it in the room. I made it in the room because I was tenacious and pushed and did what I needed to do to get in there. So I think I probably, if I were doing it over again, I would have created more of a playbook for the white men. Um, I think that they, I think they felt a little scared and a little on their heels. And because of that, I think sometimes they didn't necessarily act as well as they could have. And I'm not sure, maybe I'm sure with some it was intentional, but um, I think a lot of people just didn't know what to do. So they did nothing. Mm -hmm. so, so when trying to affect change, think about who the change is going to scare and, yes. and, and, and understand why they're scared. And, yes. and think about that and think about ways you can actually allay some of those fears and, and get them on board. Absolutely. So, yeah. Okay, good, good. And they were the last people I was thinking about because at that point I thought it was their fault. I was like, no, this is your fault. You did this. So, and, and that, you know, that takes some maturity and some experience and some time to get that level of, you know, reflection and empathy. But um, yeah, I think that they had a harder time with it than I ever would have considered or even thought to be concerned about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, shout out to Claire and Yvette. You can send me the questions on email. I can't see, we've, we've set up our Q&A yet, but uh, Claire and Yvette, go ahead and work that magic behind the scenes and I'll keep going with Layla here. Uh, this is going beautifully. Um, so you did say, well, the next question is you noticed an improvement in the pool of hiring talent. You're getting, getting a more diverse, uh, high quality uh, talent pool. Um, what advice would you give Layla to startups in supporting equal pay, especially, you know, startups are, it's rough. They, they, yeah, and you work in startups right now. You've got very, very tight budgets. Like, like one hire can make or break a firm. Uh, and and you, you don't have any place for anybody to hide. Everybody has to, has to pull more than their weight to be right. first for a startup to be successful. How do you bake in this, this culture and, and, and do it right from the start? Right. So, you know, the one thing Mark Benioff said, he, uh, wished he had done differently with Salesforce was he wished he had implemented equal pay from the beginning. Um, so I do think, although it is hard for startups and you have limited money and I'm a venture capitalist, I spent all my time with startups. I, I do understand the challenge to the point we made earlier. Um, this has to become part of the fabric of your company. Now, of course, you know, some people, if you need this super amazing engineer who has a PhD and is a genius, you know, you're gonna hire that PhD. Right, and that's going to cost you more than, say, someone who has a BA or an MBA or something like that. Um, so there are those rationales, but all of those rationales are the reason why we have this sort of situation with equal pay that we do today. You understand? So, like, I've seen a lot of startups give everyone the same pay, or everyone, you know, or I've seen, you know, the executive team gets something and the rest of the company gets something. The executive team doesn't take the raise. The executive team stops paying themselves. I've seen a lot of startups do some interesting stuff. And, and quite frankly, with COVID, you know, we've had to pivot and do some real freaky weird stuff because this is quite different um, than we've been in before. I think for a startup, you have to, if you build it into your consciousness and the type of company you want to create, if you say that's a priority for you, you will figure out how to make sure it stays a priority. And I think a good example on the Salesforce side is, Mark Benioff from the get-go wanted to put a .org next to Salesforce. That had never been done before. You know, like Kellogg had a foundation that they spun out and Ford had a foundation. These were all run as totally separate entities. They had nothing to do with the consumer or the business company. And Mark wanted to have a business that sat right with a philanthropy that sat right next to it and sort of spurred the employees on. And he did that right when they started the company. And he always makes a joke like, they gave away 1% of their equity, 1% of their time, 1% of their product. And he's like, it's really easy in the beginning because we had nothing. We had mm -hmm. no time. We had no product. We had no money. <laughs> um, so it's very funny, but 
if you're in a startup, the type of company you're going to be create, you're going to create is going to be completely determined by the values you set forth early and that you hold to throughout growth. And if you do really well and you grow really fast, that's hard. I mean, it's awesome. It's the most fun in the world. I love doing that, but it is also incredibly difficult. And if you have a strong value system, you will lean on that in those hard moments and it will help you make the right decisions. Hmm. We talked about Theranos on Monday and we hmm. talked about the, the organizational culture and the different norms and, and, and those values. And uh, just from the get go, it seemed like they, they didn't set those values and, and it just, it just snowballed and one bad thing reinforced another. So what yep. you're saying is get that straight from the get go. There's going to be rough times. You're probably mm -hmm. going to make mistakes, but, but, but cool. go back to those, go back to those values. Yeah, That's excellent. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. And, and people are also, could you have done this without Mark Benioff? Sounds like he was, no. he was halfway on board from the start. Listen, without Mark Benioff, it would have been two senior women executives complaining. That's how they would have seen it. Oh, they're complaining. They're whining. Look at them whining, complaining. That's the way women were categorized. You understand? If we fought back, we were either bitchy or bossy or complaining, you know, like, that's why so many of us just shut up and said, thank you when we got raises and when we got whatever, because we didn't want to be classified as one of these things. So no, we needed Mark. The fact that Mark is this six foot seven giant billionaire white man was super helpful, okay? Because when he said it, no one could hide. And I said that to him, you know, when we went and talked to him, I said, if you do this, no one will be able to hide from equal pay anymore. It will become a norm. It will become something everyone has to talk about. Every CEO in every interview will be asked about it. This will become part of the culture of Silicon Valley. And he knew it, right? But Cindy and I alone, no. We would have been whining, women, <laughs> complaining. Interesting. You know, it was, it, the world has changed for as much as it feels like we are as backward as we have ever been at this moment in time. The world has changed quite a bit in the last decade when it comes to the way women are treated in technology and in the workplace, the way black people are treated. It is nowhere near ready to be done by any stretch of the imagination. We have a long way to go, but we have made some progress. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I think of John Lewis, he always says like, he got beaten up on the bridge in Selma and then he introduced President Barack Obama four years later on the bridge in Selma. So it doesn't feel like progress, but there is progress. But it, you know, all of these things when we were doing them, no one had ever done this before. Mm -hmm. It was, this had never been done. No two women had gone to their CEO of a public company and said, you're not paying us the same as the men. This was unheard of. I said, mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so yeah, I mean, I think, and my advice to you too is like, keep in mind when we did this, we were senior vice presidents. I'd worked there for almost a decade. So had she. We were well established in our careers. We had made a little money. You know, this isn't, not every senior manager, this isn't gonna be the first thing you do when you graduate from Cal, probably. Maybe it is, maybe you're, you're touched in something special, but like, <laughs> I, be careful too, because as I think I tried to sort of articulate in the case, there are ramifications for making decisions like this and taking the lead and stepping out. Mm -hmm. so, so in this case, things, things aligned. And, and there, there was uh, a certain number of stars in, in alignment and you were able to, to see that and seize that opportunity and, 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 and go with it. Totally. Uh, do, do, you, do you think if it had been Mark Benioff at the helm, well, maybe you would have had a different career, different firm, et cetera. You, you would have gone somewhere else, um, so. Listen, our relationship with Mark was a big part of it. We were both yeah. close to him. He had been kind to us. He had elevated us up. He had mentored us. We've, I felt comfortable with him. I felt like I could go to his house and say this to him and he might say no. And then, okay, well, I tried, but I felt like there was a pretty good chance he would say yes too. And I had a really strong relationship with him and so did Cindy. So that's great. We're not walking into some guy's office we'd never talked to before and bringing this up. You know, mm -hmm. we, we knew him well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a bit of a different change here. Um, what questions do you think women need to ask about a company before accepting a position? And that, that's, that's much more in line with, with over 40% of our class who, who, here who are women and who are going to be negotiating for a job shortly. How can you set yourself up to, to get the, the pay you, you deserve? And then men, the men question. should listen to. The men yeah, should listen to. This question. is for everybody. Yeah, it's a hard question. Um, and it's hard because they still aren't being very transparent about pay, right? 
Um, so so this, this makes it a little bit difficult. Here are some things I would do if this is something, you know, for me, like I've, I've talked to a lot of people about joining their boards now. And whenever I talk to them, I'm like, let me explain to you who I am. I'm gonna ask about your pay practices. I'm gonna look at how many women and how many black people are on the website and on the teams. I'm gonna look at who you bring into the room while we're doing board meetings. And if that's something you're not interested in, then I don't wanna sit on your board, right? So I've earned the right to say that. But if you are looking for a job, do look at their management team and their board of directors. Who is sitting on that? Is it all a whole bunch of 50 year old white guys? Okay, well, that's something to keep in mind, right? Um, so there's a lot of information on companies. Also don't underestimate Glassdoor, you know, and, and some of these, um, you know, there are a lot of sites where employees sort of talk about the cultures of companies, specifically in technology, where you can get a lot of information from, from these places. Not all of it's true. You have to use your smart Cal filter to figure that out. Um, the other thing I would say is, and, and this most specifically to the women, whatever you think you're gonna ask for, Add, add like whatever you think sort of is like, this is sort of the most I could possibly ask for, add some on top. Okay. That's how you start the game. And whenever anyone gives you a bonus or a promotion or some stock, ask for more, right? Because that's the secret thing that the boys somehow learned along the way that we didn't. I, I didn't I, learn that. No, <laughs> not as well. well, you're in academia, Lee. That's different. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I that there's a real truth to that. And, and, and so you have to, no one's going to give you anything if you don't ask for it. Okay. And, and you're not going to get it because you did a good job. Very few people are just going to recognize that you're amazing and come and give it to you. I hope that happens to all of you in your careers. And it will sometimes, but it's not the norm. The norm is you have to stand up and tell people what you're doing and why you're important and how you contributed and why that's worth money and why they need to pay you for that. And that is something that shy people or introverted people or often cases women or people from different countries feel uncomfortable doing. But in this country, that is required if you want to make sure you get paid equally. And I think it's it's still, this, it still probably won't be equal. Yeah, you know? and I think it's, it's, it's even that that even happens in academia. And I think I'm one of those shy introverts. So. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> so, so Tuan Tu has asked here, uh, we got into a discussion yesterday uh, about well, how what how does one figure out how to pay equitably, uh, and, and and so how how do you ensure that you pay e equitably across across jobs and across people? Do you, this is a hard question. It's and, and, and do, do you have any any I can nugget, tell you nuggets this. for us? I can tell you this. Like first of all, this is a complicated question, and it really harkens back to that value conversation we were having earlier, right? Um, there are a couple things, right? Education, experience, right? Uh, awards, right? Reputation. There are a couple of these things that sort of run around and have traditionally been things that have, people have used. A geography, right? Job title, years in role, years with the company. So there are a lot of corporate metrics around people. Um, now, you're all very smart, so I'm assuming you know this, but you can give me a data set and I can argue yes or no on the same data set, depending on what I want to get accomplished, right? So I assume you all are smart enough to know that this is true. If I can do it, I'm sure you all can do, right? So, so, so knowing that, you have to really think about what are the important attributes to your company, right? So you figure out what those key things are and then you monitor it. Like the same way you would monitor a pipeline or an engineering build, right? Same way we would think about those parts of the business. You monitor the pay scale. And if you start to see that all the women are starting to fall, you have a problem, right? You'll notice what Salesforce did. We came up with a big rubric, a big metric, huge analysis with McKinsey, ran the first thing, you know, $3 million. Then we added more metrics to it. Like we didn't do a good enough job on race in the first one. So we added race and some additional metrics and we ran it again. The key to doing something like this effectively is to never stop doing it. It's not like you do it and then it's mm -hmm. done. You do this mm -hmm. every year, the way you do mm -hmm. budgeting and the way you do HR planning and the way you do engineering planning and product planning, release planning. This becomes part of the way your company functions and it's an audit, 
right? Like we do tons of audits, even in teeny little startups, we do little audits, right? Like you audit how this, how's the marketing doing? How's the pipe? How's the sales? How's engineering going? How many P0 bugs? How many P1 bugs? What's going on? You know, so this uh, equal pay becomes part of what HR starts to audit for the company and they have to report on it every year. You have to make it public. So, so this is part of that culture and that values that starts from day one. That you and always the top. have a process. Yeah. You have to have a CEO that is going to say, I prioritize this because there will be 10 million other things that need to happen. Yes, and you need indeed. to say, but this has to happen. This is not a negotiable thing because mm -hmm. there's 10 million other things to do when you're a startup, when you're a giant company, when you're a mid-market company. So that's why like Mark was super important. He's the CEO and chairman of the board. If he says do it, it's going to get done, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the toughest things we, we teach here in the M engine in a short time period is, is judgment as to which of those 10, which of those 10 million things are you going to focus on? And that's, yeah. that's really tough to do. There's no, no easy answer for this. We used Bit to of a say different... Salesforce, uh, if everything's important, nothing's important. Yeah, you have to be able to choose. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that choice is your value add as a leader. It's a huge part of your value add. So, um, so do, you, do you worry that we're baking baking our biases in when we start using machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence. Yes. And, and do you have any feelings or, or thoughts on, on that? Anything that's programmed by a human innately is going to have some bias built into it, right? And I do actually spend a lot of time thinking, I actually just invested in a company about this exact problem. That's an aside, but um, the data set, Right, that's really the key. What's the main, the main data set we run all of this across and how do we make sure that that initial data set is pure, right? Not, not my opinion on this field and your opinion on that field, and your query that pulled this data from that, but like a pure initial data set for every sort of problem we're gonna face as a society. Um, so yeah, I do worry about that. And this, I'm actually investing in this company. It's very small, no one's ever heard of it. It's called Masterful. It's three really, really smart engineers, and they're basically trying to fix this problem. They're trying to figure out how to automate data set creation without bias or any like human sort of push on it that can be applied in a multitude of different ways. And there are other companies. There's companies like Textio, which is another one of my investments, that runs across all your data and your job applications and all this stuff to remove, you know, unconscious bias. And when you're slewing a job description for a male candidate or a female candidate. Um, so, I, you know, again, I guess I'm an, a technology optimist because I grew up here and I've been doing this for so long. I think we'll solve the problem. I think our engineers and all of you, I think we'll figure out a way to, to get the problem in better control than it's in now. But again, it will be one of those things that will need constant vigilance to, to keep it sort of steady. And, and hard work and, and using yeah. technology for the better, better of society. Very, very Berkeley sort of thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So do you, th do you think Silicon Valley is ahead of the country or behind the country on this? <laughs> uh, I think Silicon Valley is ahead of the country because we made them. Um, I don't think they're actually ahead of it in practice. They're ahead of it in dialogue. Here's the thing. Lots of times companies will talk about something before they actually get it, especially in tech, right? Like what we're going to build, what's going to be happening. So I think there are a lot of companies I think a lot of companies, a lot, I think every software company knows that they will be asked this question at a certain point in scale. So they are thinking about it. And I don't think that was true before we did this. I think across the rest of the country, this conversation is, be, this really broke open with the Sony hack in Hollywood, right? When all the actresses saw that they were making like peanuts to the men and doing just as much work, if not more. So, I mean, the dialogue around equal pay has moved on to the national level, but let's be clear, that was only when we were doing this. That's why I became friends like Patricia Arquette and Lily Ledbetter and Billie Jean King. Like, we're all friends because we all sort of, from different uh, Hollywood, athletics, all these different places came together on this issue. So I think that the country is paying more attention to it. I do not think people are doing it yet. I think technology is being forced to report on it, which is making them do it more than other industries. And I think technology is being forced to report on it because Salesforce did. Interesting. So, so we talked about Google yesterday, Google's <laughs> philosophy in pay for performance. And that was a fun discussion. Uh, That's you going really take... well for them, don't you think? And all their <laughs> <human> employee relations. <laughs> 
Do, do you want to do you want to touch on that or should, should I, uh, Look, you, I mean, you can pass if you'd like? Choice. Like, here's the thing. This is why this is so complicated. This is why some of these business problems, when you're sitting in a classroom, you're like, what's wrong with you? Of course, you pay the women the same. Don't be a moron. Right. But when you're talking about like millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in salary that you cannot pay someone and redirect to a whole new engineering organization and the people aren't any wiser. You know, I, I, there's a business logic to it too. I think Google is a hard place to work. It's high performance. You gotta be really smart. You gotta know what you're doing. And because it's always been that way, it's been successful in having that type of a pay structure because the people that worked there were incented by that. I think that as companies grow, and that company is now huge, right? I, I think of Google like 10, 15 years ago. That's the Google that's in my mind. Those are my friends. They're all gone now. But like, as companies grow, you have to change, right? What worked at 10,000 people will not work at 50,000 people, will not work at 100,000 people. So, you know, that's their call. They seem to be doing pretty well. So who am I to judge, right? But, um, but that, kind of an, that kind of sort of mentality around pay leads to big inequities typically. Yeah, and, and Jing Deng has, has asked, how do you quantify something intangible like, like creativity and innovation? And that, that, that mm. is the, that's the heart of what Google does. Probably, possibly, I don't mean to say negative things about Salesforce, but maybe more than Salesforce even, that, that they are totally. really in the business of innovation. And how do you quantify that kind of intangible? It's... Well, then, I mean, I wouldn't go to Google on that because I actually think Apple is more creative, right? Mm -hmm. So okay. like you look at the way Apple treated Johnny Ive. I mean, he's their top designer. He left a couple of years ago, but he designed the iPhone, iPad, he did all of it. I mean, he was like a celebrity, mm -hmm. right? So there are companies that have figured out how to sort of value that creativity component. I mean, again, not to get, sound like a dead, like beat a dead horse here, but it's your values, mm -hmm. your values, right? Are you gonna put, you know, salespeople are foreign operated for a reason, right? Engineers have to check in a certain amount of code. Wait, wait, S salespeople are coin operated for a reason? Yeah, they I make love, they, I, they I, know I love exactly. that. <laughs> they know, but they know, right? Their yeah, yeah, target yeah. is clear. You, measure it. you yeah, make yeah. this much money, yep, you bring yep, in this yep. much money, you make this much money. Engineering mm -hmm. is almost easy too. You check in this much code, you finish the feature, this few bugs, this yeah, yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Marketing even to a lot of every function in the business has some kind of lever. And then there's the creativity component on top, which makes someone not just a good engineer, but a great engineer, right? And not just a good salesperson, but a great salesperson. So most companies have built into their rubric, their performance rubric, how they view that, right? And if there's the numbers, but there's also if you're the best manager, if everyone loves working for you, if you're constantly volunteering and helping people think well of the company, I mean, we had a lot of different metrics at Salesforce to think about because we had volunteering and all these other components. We tried to look at the whole person. And I think that was a, that's not traditionally how people have considered paying their employees. And I think that was a big difference too. But what's important to Salesforce might be not be important to Google, might not be important to Apple, right? Like that's why it, it, it's such a hard problem because there's no like, here's the playbook, everyone pay everyone this way, no conversation. It's not really how it works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How did you, it, it, is this still a big part of your life? And the question here from Shay is, is, you know, it got solved for you, but it still seems to be a big, it still seems to be very important to you. And, oh my and how, God, how, yeah. Yeah, how, how, how did you keep that motivation and, and uh, fervor? Well, I have a lot of energy. That's one thing I will say. Um, listen, uh, I worked really hard. My parents are immigrants. My, you know, I came here first generation. My parents went to Cal. Uh, we never really felt like we belonged in this country. Right? There was sort of this like you belong, but you don't feeling, which I was always a little bit freaked out by. And I worked really hard. Like I worked in product management and engineering. There were no women. This was like 20 years ago. I'm a lot older than all of you. Like there were no women in product management. There were no women in engineering. I was alone most of the time. Um, and I could handle that. Like, I was like, okay, I'll break through that. But when I found out they were making more money than me, man, that made me crazy. I mean, that made me crazy. Like, are you kidding? How can I ever get where I wanna go if I'm getting cut out before I even show up? 
So like I look, I could it would have been a lot easier for me to just go yell at them and make them give me more money. And I probably would have gotten more, right? In some ways. Like, but I all of a sudden saw this opportunity where I had the connections, the ability, the platform, the will, and and the really the, the ability to do this, not just for me, but for as many people as I possibly could, as many as possible. And so now this is like. And this is a huge part of who I am. I talk about this all the time. I give people advice all the time. I, this is like, a, when I die, it'll be like mother, wife, <laughs> equal pay. Like, I mean it. I, 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 this for me, work is hard, right? That's why they pay you. And it's not supposed to be a super good time. If you can figure out a way to go to work and have a pretty good time, you're winning. If you can figure out a way to go to work and have a pretty good time and make money and do something important for society, then you're really winning. Then you're really winning. Then work doesn't feel like work. Work feels like a purpose. Work feels like you're doing something bigger. And look, I like money, okay? I was never gonna work at a nonprofit. I, I absolutely wanted to make a lot of money. I said that from the time I was a little girl on up. So, you know, I didn't wanna just make money and not do anything back. And then when I got the opportunity to do such a big thing, and to impact so many different ways of the way women were sort of viewed. It was, it was a huge moment and it continues to be a huge part of who I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, we've got some other, other thoughts here asking about the Latinx and other, other diversity. Yeah. And that, that, that's part of what you've done. You've expanded to other, other under, underrepresented uh, I have. minorities. So, so. Yeah, so Salesforce, after we did Equal Pay, we hired the chief diversity officer we started um, really engaging in our employee resource groups more. And um, the black employee resource group at Salesforce called Bold Force asked me to be their exec sponsor. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm not black. Like, no, <laughs> like, I'm sure. And they were like, no, no, we want you. Um, and it became probably one of the most important relationships of my professional life. I really got to spend a lot of time focusing on what it felt like to be black at Salesforce, black in tech. Um, black in America, um, and this was years ago, right? So it, that, as well as you know, my partner Cindy is Latin, Latinx. She's you know she's from Mexico. So the whole time through, that was a big part of what you know when we were doing equal pay. That was a big part of what we were talking about. Look, I mean, this all we all go up together, as far as I'm concerned. And 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 so yeah, I think that the problem is more acute for people of color. Quite frankly, I'm a white woman. I, I have a lot of advantage in the fact that I'm a white woman. I'm, th there are a lot of things that are assumed when I walk in the room just because of the way I look. I'm chubby, I'm loud, you know, I have my own things that people do, but no, I'm white, right? So I get the benefit of the doubt from most people, which is weird, right? And I think that's where Peace Corps comes in because I have actually had an experience for three years of my life where I was the only white person and being white was the thing that didn't make sense in this place. And I saw how that felt and how people reacted to me. And so, you know, these are building these different types of parts into who you are as a person and thinking about how you're gonna bring that self to work is important. I wanted to be someone that stood up for other people. I wanted to be someone who was helping everyone. Like, yes, women, of course, that one's easy. I'm a woman, like I can completely relate to that. But when I really started thinking about what it felt like to be black in tech or Hispanic in tech or Asian in tech or Indian in tech, um, it's, it's, a, it's different, right? And so increasing my understanding of that and helping other people get better about that and understand that their role in that has been important, right? I remember, and I tell this story, I don't even know what story I told, but um, when I was the exec sponsor of Bold Force, we were at a, a, a we were at a, a high level meeting with all the execs and we were talking about getting more black employees and I said I was talking black employees black employees and we went, got up to walk to the bathroom and like four different people came up to me and they're like hey Layla hey Layla I want to tell you something and I thought they were going to say good job bringing up that topic we need to talk about that so great and they were all like Layla you can't say black you can't use that word and in my mind I was like how you can't change anything if you can't talk about it right so Wherever I see a way to try to help other people, I do, but it's hard. It's, the world is set up for white men, at least America is. Um, so it's gonna take a while for us to break that down and rebuild it, but I believe we are in the process.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a bit, a bit of a, a divergence here for those of us that are parents. How do, how do you balance a career with parenting? Most of our students are a little young for that, uh, but uh, if oh, you have any insights good. there. So. Yeah, look, first of all, my kids are my greatest accomplishment of everything I've done. That is the thing I'm most proud of. So if you want to have kids, you should have kids. And don't let anyone talk you out of that, ever. That's my one little advertising there. Um, look, it was hard and we had help, right? We had nannies and stuff. And then eventually when we turned 40, my husband was a lawyer and he really didn't like being a lawyer. Um, and so he was like, I don't wanna be a lawyer anymore. I wanna go back to school and I'll take care of the kids. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, please. Please, 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 as fast as possible. <laughs> so I have had a lucky, lucky thing because for the last seven years, my husband has sort of taken the lead as he's gotten another degree and done some other stuff. Um, but it's hard, right? I, a lot of the time I felt like I was a bad mom. And then other times I felt like I was a bad executive the firm, you know, the sales force or the firm needed me to do something, go fly somewhere to close a deal or go do something. That means I'm not home helping with dinner and homework and bedtime. Um, so I was, you know, I'm lucky I had a, I have a great partner and we really talked and worked out sort of a plan for us, but um, it's challenging. I, I, my hope is that COVID is humanizing being a parent a little bit in a way that it was never going to happen when we all ran off to the office. Cause like I was on a call today and someone was shaking her baby and I was, it was amazing. I was like, I wanted to kiss the baby and grab the baby, you know, like, but it, it, that was totally normal to have her shaking the baby. It's interesting. We doing the call. So my hope is, and I've been thinking about this a little bit that perhaps COVID and, and sort of look, you're looking in my house, you know, you, you, you have a different perspective. Um, perhaps it will normalize some of those more human behaviors we have that are That's often, we feel like we need to push them down at work. I think I, my hope is some of the good that will come out of this nightmare we're in is some of that, some of that normalization. That's interesting. Yeah, some silver lining, which, which we all need, I think, right now. So any, any last big thoughts? You had a nice thing in the video. I don't know if you could top that one, uh, <laughs> but, but given, our, given our, our discussion today, any, any last Listen, uh, pieces yeah. of advice? This is a hard time. This is a hard time. I'm 47 years old. This is the hardest time I've ever lived through. It was a hard time. And, you, you know, and, and I think my main advice to you is you're going to be okay. Right? You are going to be okay. You are going to a great school. You are super smart. Technology is a great thing to do. It has problems, big problems, like every business, like every industry. But you are in a great place to do it. You are, and, and we're going to be okay. We're gonna, there's another side to all of this. And hopefully we'll all be smarter. And hopefully you guys will build some stuff it will help us get there as a society better. But um, it's a hard time. Be nice to yourself and like give yourself a break and give other people a break because it really, I've never, I mean, I thought I lived through some shit, nothing compared to what's going on right now. I would so, agree. you know, I have compassion for you and you know, coming to school and sitting through class and it's hard, right? Everything's hard right now. So just be nice to yourself, do something for yourself. Go on a smoke walk around Berkeley. <laughs> have a pack of cigarettes from the box, it's terrible. Just hang in there is my main thing. And don't worry, you're gonna get a job. Okay, don't worry, don't worry about that. Okay, stay healthy, focus on getting smarter. You're gonna find a job, it's gonna be a great job. Your parents will be proud of you, you'll be happy. Don't worry, don't worry so much, just. Thank you, good. Well, thank you so very, very much. Layla Seka, Coleman Fung Institute for Engineering Leadership Board Member. Take care everybody. Take See care, you tomorrow. Thanks, Lee. Last day at boot camp. Take care, everybody.